Uh, on November 4th of last year, I organized a conference here at Shepherd named around Christina Nicholson's novel, The Book of Unknown Americans. While the conference posted many wonderful papers, a keynote address given by Dr. Lemus Charman, I felt unsatisfied. After the conference, I decided to further investigate the novel by writing a paper which looked at the various barriers in Rickus' character's face. And after a few months, a handful of scholarly articles, and a lot of revision, that paper became this project. While this is only a very small piece of a larger work, which hopes to consider the effects various barriers have on Latinx migrants and their identities, I hope it encourages you to further explore the topics I introduce. Gloria Anzaldúa's How to Tame a Wild Tongue and Christina Enriquez's The Book of London Americans are both works fascinated with borders. While Anzaldúa focuses on a literal border between peoples and what life is like for people living on these border lands, Enriquez looks beyond a geographic border to present the idea that today, borders exist all around us. Both Enriquez and Alza Dua describe a division between Anglo-Americans and Latinx American migrants. When analyzed together, however, these two works bring to light an aspect of borders which often goes ignored. The Book of Unknown Americans presents the complexities of a Latinx migrant experience by depicting a residential building as a borderland. However, Enriquez expands upon Alza Dua's analysis by describing two borders, the border which separates the migrants from the Anglo-American world, and a second meaningful border that separates the tenants from one another with significant consequences. Enriquez's novel mirrors also do his discussion of borders within and beyond geographic restraints, creating a residential building to be both a literal and symbolic border. Geographically, the building creates a border between Latinx characters and the other residents of their town in Delaware. The apartment complex is inhabited by Enriquez's Latinx characters, a chain link fence serving to effectively separate them from the Anglo-American world. When Alma Rivera speaks with the landlord, he says, quote, here is us, Venezuela, Puerto Rico, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Colombia, Mexico, Panama, Paraguay, we have it all, unquote. Here he argues that within the building, they are unified as a Latinx group and separate from the rest of the world. In this building alone, characters are forced to navigate the very borders also do describes, such as when she writes, quote, nosotros los chicanos straddle the borderlands. On one side of us, we hear constantly exposed to the Spanish of the Mexicans, and on the other, we hear Anglo's incessant clamor we forget our language, unquote. For Alza Dua, this border is very clear. She literally straddles the borders of Mexico and Texas. Enriquez's characters, on the other hand, live in Delaware, far from a natural border, yet still find themselves in a borderland. For Enriquez, Alza Dua's borders and the challenges they carry exist without the necessity of ge geographic proximity. Just like the unknown Americans, the borders are everywhere. Despite the sense of community that the tenants of the building create, there is still a strong degree of alienation between the different cultures, a border within the larger border of the building. <laughs> the clearest demonstration of this division is the contrast between a character's statement and Enriquez's stylistic choice to depict various <coughs> backstories. First, as the Rivera's move into the apartment complex, Vito Angelino tells Alma that she'll fit right in, as he's describing the various cultures which live there. He says, quote, I try to make this building like an island for all of us washed ashore refugees, a safe harbor. Here, Angelina was describing the first border. The Riveras will fit right in with the other residents, not because of a shared cultural background, but because they fall on one side of the border and is constructed safe harbor for Latinx migrants. <coughs> However, Enriquez crafts dynamic and different tenant histories, asserting the importance of each character's unique experience. In this juxtaposition, readers see both borders. The first provides a sense of connection and community, uniting Latinx characters. The second separates their different countries and experiences. Also, do it does mention this feeling of distinction, writing, quote, there is no one Chicano language just as there is no one Chicano experience. <coughs> However, Enriquez more fully depicts the second border by presenting many cultures under one roof. One of the most obvious tactics that Enriquez employs to demonstrate differences between her characters is the short histories she gives on each of them, a taste of their home countries. Rafael describes how he desperately misses Panama, saying, quote, all those streets and places I loved, the way it smelled of car exhaust and sweet fruit, the thickness of the heat, the sound of dogs barking in alleyways, <coughs> In contrast, Benny describes his relief in leaving Nicaragua, saying, quote, leaving poverty to go to the richest country in the world didn't take too much convincing, unquote. Just in the sharp differences between these two stories, readers are forced to acknowledge that the characters are not one monolithic identity. Gustavo similarly experiences distinct cultures at once, being both Mexican and Guatemalan. He discusses the horror of living in Guatemala in 1960. Yet in Mexico, he finds a troubling life, writing, quote, the Mexicans look down on us. <coughs> I tell them I was half Mexican, only make things worse, unquote. Because the Mexicans choose to separate Gustavo from themselves, Enriquez presents that the border is not merely a sign of difference, but an active creation. 
Existing in the space of dueling orders creates a sense of unholiness within the characters. Or as Louise Tyson puts it, quote, the feeling of being caught between two cultures, of belonging to neither, rather than both. In other words, Enriquez's characters feel dislocated, as if they don't belong anywhere at all. I would argue that this dislocation stems from existing on not one, but two distinct quarters. Also, do a reckless writes that this, quote, voluntary and forced alienation makes for psychological conflict, <coughs> a kind of dual identity, unquote. While Also, do it here is talking about Anglo American and Mexican culture specifically, I believe that by applying her arguments to Enriquez's text, we can begin to understand the complex alienation that also exists between Latinx cultures. Enriquez's characters are doubly alienated, doubly psychologically conflicted. As we all know, quote, I wasn't allowed to claim the thing I felt, and I didn't feel the thing I was supposed to claim, unquote. Straddling the borderlands and negotiating his place as both a Latinx other and an other of Panama, Mayor's unholiness culminates in a loss of identity. Trapped in these borderlands, Enriquez's characters and all unknown Americans scramble for a sense of belonging. In Enriquez's work, the perils of walking the borderlands between Anglo-American and Latinx American <coughs> culture seem much more dangerous than the borders between one another. Much like Anza Duga writes when she presents the idea of the colonization of language, Enriquez argues that the first border often represents a violent unbalance of power. For Anza Dua, this perspective is quite clear. She writes on English as, quote, the oppressor's language, unquote. Alma tries to learn English. However, in this attempt, she reports, quote, English is such a dense, tight language, so many hard letters, like miniature walls, not open with vowels the way Spanish is. Our throats open, our mouths open, our hearts open. In English, the sounds are closed. Here, Alma acknowledges the harshness of English. <coughs> Even the language itself is full of borders, miniature walls. Enriquez presents a reason that the first border, which separates Anglo-Americans from Latinx Americans, can be much more destructive than the second. Uh, the Spanish-speaking characters who live together in the building are open. On the other hand, the non-Spanish speakers are closed, often unwilling to understand one another. This isn't to say that the second border isn't destructive. However, I would argue that this destruction is often much different, at least in Enriquez's work. Though there are cases in which Latinx characters generalize one another, often the dangerousness lies in the non-Latinx characters ignoring the second quarter and generalizing the entire group. <clears throat> the dangers that arise from walking the border in lands culminate in Arturo Rivera's death. Mayor imagines the scene as a confrontation with a language border. In the novel, the scene reads as follows. Senor Rivera stepped back, raising his hands in the air to show he meant no harm. I'm looking for my daughter. He says in Spanish. We speak English here. Please, Senor Rivera says, in English this time, one of the few words he knows. And then here it's death is the trigger. Anzaldua writes of the quote, hammer blow of Norte Americano culture, unquote. And for Arturo, the hammer falls as he's shot because of his cultural identity. This scene illustrates a crucial aspect of Enriquez's argument. The border which divides Anglo Americans from Latinx migrants is literally deadly. Even as Arturo switches to English, a desperate attempt to satisfy Garrett's father, he shoots, showing that perhaps it isn't Arturo or any Latinx's inability to speak English, which angers Garrett's father. Here, Enriquez reports on the dangers of lumping all Latinx's into one category of ignoring the second border. Garrett's father murders Arturo because he assumes that a Latinx man is dangerous, relying on an inaccurate stereotype of what it means to be of a certain ethnic background. Without considering any aspects of Arturo himself, let alone his home country, the murderer, like many others, disregards the significance of individual self in favor of racist generalities. The startling conclusion of the Book of Unknown Americans presents the urgent need to understand and disrupt both sets of borders that Latinx migrants face. As Enriquez writes, quote, we're the unknown Americans, the ones no one even wants to know because they've been told they're supposed to be scared of us and because maybe if they did take the time to get to know us, they might realize we're not all that bad, maybe even that we're a lot like them, unquote. By acknowledging the borderlands Latinx migrants face and attempting to understand their experience, readers can begin to realize that these borders needn't be as divisive as they are. We're a lot like them, Enriquez's character reports. Arturo's death becomes a cautionary tale about the dangers of ignoring all to do with borderlands. Enriquez creates the potential for change in the real world. However, instead of disrupting the borders, our country focuses on building walls, creating more division. Of course, as a white native-born citizen, I can only say so much about the struggles that Enriquez's characters face. <coughs> While I cannot describe these experiences in the most authentic way, we need to be giving platforms of expression to those who can. In 
and our current world of borders, listening and creating bridges of understanding becomes more and more vital. Works like the Book of Unknown Americans become essential keystones of enlightenment as we attempt to navigate our increasingly divisive world. Thank you. Questions and comments for Brianna? Yeah. Oh, it's a very interesting paper. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I don't know the work. Um, but I was really interested in the analysis, and um, especially the distinction between the two borders, the inner and the outer. And, uh, but, uh, 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 I'm a little puzzled by the by the example of the of the shooting. Yeah. Because it wasn't really the second border, it was the first border, wasn't it? Well, a little bit. So it, yes, it was the first border because they're distinct. But I think that what I was trying to say is that um, when the non latinx characters, such as Garrett's father, ignore the second border of them being there being different sorts of cultures. So he assumes that because um, Arturo Rivera is a Latinx character, that he's Mexican and that he's dangerous, and he puts them into this larger lump of Latinx characters that a lot of times the Anglo-American characters in the book do. So they're, and the, I'm using it as second order because I'm saying that what he could have done was created a distinction between, you know, this culture that he thinks is a certain way, and then um, Garrett's father is very different. I don't even think he's the same culture as what um, Garrett's father is to me. I don't know if that makes sense. But I mean, I think what I was trying to say is that both borders are destructive, <coughs> and if we want to be creative and to avoid this like dangerousness that happens, we need to think about the fact that these Latinx migrants, they're not one monolithic identity, they're very plural. And so in creating this idea that they're all the same, that's what brings these sort of instances. Well, that's brilliant. I like that very much. And you know, I, uh, uh, I related to some of the most I know, Sanders, Cisneros, and other books. You know, no Sanders. Okay, so anyway, but uh, did you hear the story about the uh, Japanese uh, exchange student who came to the house and it was supposed to be a party and he rang the bell to the wrong address and someone inside says freeze, he didn't know what it meant mm -hmm. yeah. and he was shot dead and uh, the court let the homeowner say, well, you know, he was defending this. Yeah, because we have this idea of immigrant being a dangerous word. But he said freeze, which is like a, you know, idiom that the Japanese yeah. uh, the student didn't understand. Yeah, and as much as, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was going to say, as much as language is supposed to be this sort of constructive act, in a lot of ways for these characters, it ends up being very destructive because they can't, they don't know how to use it to their advantage and it ends up hurting them. Did you at one point use the term un unhomeliness? Yeah. For one yeah. Of the characters? That makes me think a lot of the word in Heimlich, which means the uncanny. Did you do that on purpose? or? I, did, I was looking more at um, unhomeliness in terms of like, being two persons and then neither. So my larger paper looks more at like identity construction and the ways that their identities are destroyed. So I haven't heard that term before. But it's a concept out of Freud to talk about uh, kind of a, both uh, an eerie, double like lack of familiarity and alienation with something that's familiar. Yeah, the uncanny. But the, the way that you were describing like the murder at the end, there is a kind of horrific element, you mm -hmm. know, to, to this to this leveling of identity to a fearful projection of what you expect to see that I think that that concept even if it's not explicitly evoked that mm -hmm. your your use of that word that kind of opened up this whole new way for me of thinking about connections that your paper well yeah and I think too I didn't get to talk about it in this paper but there's this even added level, level of like um, of terror because this isn't a scene that actually happens we're hearing Mayor a young boy's imagination of what could have happened all he knows is that um, a man was shot because a man thought he was dangerous and he couldn't speak English. And so the fact that this um, teenager in the novel just expects that this is the scene that happened, it's just an added level of just like uncomfortability that this is the sort of society that this boy is growing up in. Yeah. And she's using it in the homey baba sense, yeah. right, of unholiness, which is a modification and an adaptation of the, <laughs> the Freudian concept. So that's what I'm <laughs> Thank you, Brianna. Thank you.